um, some of you may, may know of two, two or three of you raised it with me this week <coughs> that uh, nonviolence is in the news, though not very much in the United States news, but in Burma, Miramar, where there's been a struggle going on for, uh, what, 15 years? It's in the book um, as well. If what? If, um, like, Myanmar did work on the Tumor entity, that he would not cooperate with them economically with the ASEA because they used the ASEA, because the ec regional economic interests. Ah, yeah. Uh -huh. He's actually making it. Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. Right. Yeah, yeah regional. Uh -huh. Right. Okay, but you see, part of, the, part of the problem with Burma and Miramar is that it's a military government uh, that's rejected every election in the last, I think, maybe 20 years now. I uh, haven't kept up with that. But, uh, but the, the big difficulty is that it's American guns that advise the military, American advisors. They're part of our network. And in addition to that, American business and Western European businesses all want a piece of the action. And just as in China, they're willing to work with a dictatorship as long as they can do the capitalism. So uh, in uh, Miramar, the same spirit abides. Uh, and, 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 and basically, probably the media in the United States will not do very much coverage of it uh, simply because it's not within the kind of uh, struggle in a nation that fits our neoliberal models. Uh, it could be something else. Anyway, uh, let's continue with, with our nonviolent effort with this uh, video on South Africa. One of, the, one of the things about the South Africa history is that apartheid government history is that al almost everywhere you see in the conventional uh, conversations of South Africa of how it was primarily uh, the arm of the sword, the wing of the sword, that was started relatively late, late by the ANC, the African National Congress. Uh, that was the primary factor in the release of uh, Mandela from jail and so forth and so on. And of course, that's, that's uh, very much of a, of a lie. It's a part of the failure to really look at a situation with any kind of uh, depth of of what went on. But anyway, this, this, uh, this video is a very good video. So let's look at it and, and uh, supplement it uh, with your reading and then with a, a bit of a conversation afterwards. <laughs> All right, questions, comments, discussion of this piece? Pretty clear video. Go ahead. I see two hands over here. Speak up. Yeah. There was a, a quote there that I didn't get. I thought he said something like, you know, we have to, um, we need methods which can withstand the harsh scrutiny of. Yeah, that was one of his statements. Greg, you want to tell the whole group? All right, the other hand, go ahead. I can't hear you. Oh, yes, 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 right.
that was uh, uh, Berthe, Barthe, B-O-T-H-E, who was an earlier uh, prime minister who, who made that statement. But of course, uh, apartheid government was in our Cold War anti-communist ideology and war making. Um, this is one of the tragic stories of our 20th century history because uh, uh, Tutu was a communist according to our analysis of the situation. Mandela was a communist. Everybody was a communist. There was a, there was a small communist party, but it was a part of the um, African National Congress coalition. <laughs> And one of the signers for the 1955 Freedom Charter that um, ANC uh, made as a guideline <coughs> to what kind of society they wanted to create. And um, the uh, South Africa Communist Party signed that charter. That charter became then like the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence uh, for the ANC and they pressed it and pushed it from 55 on. All right, other questions or comments? Uh, neither the book chapter nor the video talks about the importance of the organization of labor unions in the 1970s. Labor unions were illegal under apartheid government and there was not to be any kind of organizing, but um, South Africans on their own organized local unions in the gold mines, in the factories, and then they organized regional uh, labor organizations linking them to each other. Then they organized the National Federation, I've forgotten the exact name of it, the National Federation of unions in the country. They became a rather powerful force um, because uh, they pushed for freedom and they pushed for self-consciousness as well as better wages. They educated their people about people's power, about participating in the society. So they became a major civic organization in, the, in 85. They were part of the major pieces of civic organizations across the country and were very, very important. Um, uh, these authors do not see uh, that as a major event, but I maintain that uh, at the time it was enormous. They were all illegal and they organized anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, tens of thousands of workers that got, got into unions from all industries. Uh, and, and, and the like. So that was a very important piece of it, I think, uh, in the whole development of uh, parallel uh, institutions, neighborhood, national, uh, civic organizations that were parallel to the government and organizing the people to think differently from the apartheid government. That's a very, very critical piece in nonviolent struggle. Um, uh, the, the parallel organizations. Any other uh, comments on this? Now uh, you hear these, these um, you hear the, this video critiques the uh, armed uh, struggle which Nelson Mandela endorsed and encouraged in the organizing. If I remember correctly, Nelson Mandela, Mandela himself went into um, Zimbabwe, one of the border states, uh, or, um, Botswana. beg pardon? Botswana. Botswana, to uh, receive military training. Yeah, that's right. So he. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, he, he was like many other African self determinants. Uh, who, 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 uh, want, who did organize in, in terms of military action as a, as a last resort because, and because they, wanted not, they did not want, in this case, they did not want ANC 
to lose out to other forces that might organize under them and around them and start stuff that therefore ANC would not have a hand in helping to shape and move in the right direction. Uh, but Nelson Mandela in his um, autobiography uh, tells how he insisted that the armed struggle uh, would be humanistic. <laughs> it would do sabotage, but it would not kill people. Um, it, um, it, so they, they put limits on it, and uh, it never reached any degree of effectiveness. So when, when people say, well, it was the armed struggle, it was not. It was what you saw in this film. And this film could be, you know, could be several times longer and could move from city to city <laughs> where e economic boycotts and civic organization where the UDF, the United Democratic Front, uh, got organized in the 80s to offset the banning of the, of the ANC. Now, uh, this is again an illustration in the 20th century of effective nonviolence um, action. And it, this does tell the whole story, but a piece of the story. They used many, many facets of it. They began uh, as far back as 50 years before, uh, 1994. Uh, yes, they began. Um, I was in college in 47 to 52, and they were carrying on nonviolent uh, campaigns in South Africa, the ANC. Uh, that, that, that early leadership that was replaced by then people like Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu and others. Uh, the the um, uh, early organizers of ANC sought all sorts of... of uh, of uh, nonviolent action, petition, letters, uh, boycotts, marches, picketing, uh, jawboning with uh, apartheid government people and leaders, um, telling their story overseas to Europe, to the World Council of Churches, to others, trying to enlist the aid of the Western nations in breaking the back of apartheid government. They, uh, did not uh, make any headway in those days at all. The United States was caught very deeply in the Cold War and was not interested in seeing self-determination actions anywhere in the, in the world, uh, not just Africa, but anywhere. You may or may not know that with the Cold War mentality and ideology that uh, started in by 1947, uh, largely out of the United States. The United States, as an official policy, did not support <coughs> the self-determination of a single former colony of any country of the British Empire or the Portuguese or the uh, Dutch or the um, Netherlands or Belgium. They supported the French. They supported no self-determination movement after World War II. When, of course, out of World War II, all sorts of people were um, committed to the notion that uh, Angola will be free. We, we will not be in a Portuguese province. Uh, uh, as early as 1933, the Vietnamese began to organize the uh, um, resistance movement to French occupation. And um, uh, in 1933, that's right, 1933, Ho Chi Minh was a student in, in France, in, in Paris, and began the process of organizing the independence movement for self-determination and did it around Thomas Jefferson's thought and the Declaration of Independence in the USA Constitution. Um, so, um, uh, but that w did not have sympathy, of course, in France and did not have sympathy in the United States. Though Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president uh, during World War II, 
uh, enlisted Ho Chi Minh in the fight against the Japanese and supplied him with arms and weapons and advisors and food uh, as uh, Ho Chi Minh, by this time having an army, used the army to fight the Japanese uh, uh, invasion. And uh, Roosevelt had promised Ho Chi Minh that with the end of the war against the Japanese and the Germans and Italians, that uh, he would not support the um, uh, re-entry into Southeast Asia of the French, um, but would instead push internationally for those countries to begin to shape their independence. That, of course, was broken with his death in 45. We picked up the cost for the French army to move back into Southeast Asia. So uh, the point I was making is that not a single self-determination movement was supported by official American policy, State Department, Pentagon, CIA, Congress. And uh, in, a, in addition to that, they were all called communist. They were all called communists and terrorists and uh, tyrants uh, trying to destroy <laughs> colonies. Uh, trying to destroy a colony was uh, considered anti-American uh, and uh, authoritarian, though most of them uh, in Africa and Asia were bitten by the uh, notions of freedom and democracy and equality and justice and uh, at least talk that talk about what they wanted to have happen in their societies uh, as, the, uh, as the European empires moved. So um, the Congress backed, the Congress backed the um, divestment of American companies in South Africa, apartheid government, by stint of the Free South Africa Movement, which was one of the strong movements in the late 70s, the 80s, that spread from campus to campus, it was peopled by uh, tens of thousands of students all around the country and by many civic organizations, um, many confrontations in the universities as students called for the disinvestment of, uh, divestment rather, of of uh, endowment funds and university investments in companies that were doing business in, so in apartheid South Africa. So it was a rather massive movement, lots of civil disobedience. Uh, um, South African villages built on, uh, uh, in campus grounds, uh, just a, a rather widespread uh, movement. I don't know if there's been any books written about that movement. Uh, but it was a fairly, fairly good and strong social movement. But so Congress then called for disinvestment. Congress called for the ending of our military support of the South African army. And all we never got the CIA to move out of South Africa <laughs> uh, uh, or our military advisors. But Congress did do it, and then they basically forced. Uh, President Reagan to support the divestment. Um, and um, uh, that was a major um, piece of power that joined with what the South Africans were doing themselves to break the apartheid government and force uh, the clerk to uh, do what he did then in the early 90s. All right, any questions or comments on any of that? All right, yes? So you're saying they had the first time the U.S. Um, voted self-determination? Yes, they did. They, um, the Carter administration, I, I, I will repeat, I will do the other one. The Carter administration, when Andrew Young was U.N. ambassador for the United States, the Carter administration supported Andrew Young's analysis of Mugabe, who was engaged in a violent uh, effort to have a violent revolution in what was called uh, 
southern Rhodesia, not very successful, but nevertheless he was creating tr mayhem and trouble. Um, and um, Andrew Young was instrumental in getting uh, Geneva talks started with uh, the Rhodesian government, the southern Rhodesian government, and with uh, Mugabe's forces. And then he uh, guided them and worked with them, and the Carter administration, administration then supported the agreement whereby democratic elections uh, were established in a new constitution and all of that, which ca caused the transfer of power from the white minority to the black majority. Uh, but uh, as you w very well know, Zimbabwe is in um, a terrible turmoil, mayhem, because Mugabe has become more and more of a tyrant. Um, but again, he's able to make it because he's getting enough investment and capital funds <laughs> um, uh, to make a go of it. Very rich country, minerally and otherwise, uh, but um, uh, uh, one of the great tragedies. So that's the one other exception. Um, all right, any other questions or comments on that? Yes, ma'am. All right, good question. Chile was, uh, had a long hast history of democracy before 1973. Had a, had, a, had a good history of democracy. Uh, though we, you know, as uh, we have been, uh, we dominated lots of stuff. Okay, in the case of uh, almost all of them, you have to say that... Uh, They break with the government. That's, that's a major thing that happens. They withdraw their consent, as Gene Sharp indicates as a major principle. They do it for a variety of reasons. There is a rising consciousness, and people see that they have a chance to make a difference if they link with each other and they uh, reach that point of no return where, and you can see that somewhat in this film uh, because the struggle has gone on for 60 years. Then now 1985, they get the key economic boycott of the white business community, which is usually in a separate section in, uh, all across South Africa. And the net result is that that spreads and they discover that they can act and function together without a lot of disunity. Uh, and township after township is united in it. Uh, so um, uh, this process causes a new sort of mental um, unity, uh, unity of action, of purpose. They are striking at economic power, and they are implicating in the South Africa. Their uh, young uh, Miss Cherry, Dr. Cherry, who is a university professor now, I, as I remember, um, she points to the fact that it it implicates it implicates the white community and society, which up to that time they really hadn't done. So in a sense, they unified the nation around the struggle, whereas before the ANC struggles were, and, and others were basically sort of confined to the, to the black 
uh, to black Africans, uh, never touch the investments, never touch the white society that was going on with prosperity uh, in any fashion. Now that's part of the issue in the United States. There's a lot of great unrest in the United States, but a great numbers of white people identify with the white power structures and not with themselves. Uh, in health care, housing, homelessness, and so forth. They see themselves separate. Yes? Just kind of along the same lines, I think you mentioned in one of the previous classes you thought there should be a body and we need to have similar movements. We need to have in the 20th century occur again in the 21st century. Like, what do you think can unify the people and create a movement uh, are you speaking just generally? Just like you said, you feel like yeah. these movements need to happen again in this century to achieve the equality that we need. Right. So what do you, I was, like, what do you think needs to happen to unify the people or to create this awareness that these, this needs to happen again? In the United States? In the United States. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that down the road. But one of the great problems with the United States is that we have no serious political organizing uh, around opposition to the bipartisan stuff that we've been experiencing in the last 30 years. No, no serious political organizing. Uh, and with a strong effort on the part of people who think of themselves as centrist or progressives, that when a movement begins to struggle, you redirect it into elections. You, you move it. This is an old trick, uh, an old strategy. Robert Kennedy tried it on us, as we'll come back to that, uh, in the early 60s, as Robert and John Kennedy became the major figures of an administration, and were sympathetic and willing to listen and learn they nevertheless wanted to direct us to, com to uh, voter registration, um, uh, get out of the street, get out of main intervention and do the voter registration. So, but, but we do not have a political opposition in the United States that's a serious organizing project. Um, we will not see that great a difference on the Iraq war if a Democrat becomes president in, 19, in 2008. We, we will not see a huge difference in the rhetoric on, on the war on terrorism. <laughs> and we will not see any great difference in the use of the CIA or the Pentagon or the military budgets. Uh, that, that policy will go forward. And that policy represents what? It represents the notion that the United States government has a major stake around the world in seeing to it that our um, uh, businesses can expand and dominate Europe, Africa, Latin America, Asia. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, in its greed, has a notion that the wealth is out there <laughs> and it's out there so like climbing Mount Everest because it's there it, it ought to be available for some people to grab hold of as much of it as possible uh, no matter how they may do it. Now that, many will disagree with me about that but I think that's part of the reality we're facing. Uh, the other thing in South Africa, the civic organization that was stressed here but a, but a very important factor in all of this was coming to a conclusion, and you saw a couple of scenes where uh, Mkusili Jack was saying out in the streets, we have this violence, we throw stones and all, all, all so forth. We see our uh, friends being killed one by one by the police and the military. It's not doing us any good. It's about time for us to change that and move to some of the strategy that way work better. Uh, uh, and that certainly was one of the factors here. In Chile, the political parties persuaded the so-called leftist revolutionary groups 
that the Molotov cocktail had no place, would not do anything for them, that a united front and a united political effort would enable them to, to cast Pinochet out. So they persuaded lots of people. We have no such effort going on in the United States, yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to come back to how you organize nonviolently. There's not a great deal of difference between organizing nonviolently or violently, <laughs> except in the methodology and the philosophy. In either case, you have to organize, you have to recruit people, you have to train people. You have to get them committed to the strategy and the mission that you see as important for the organizing. There are some very clear similarities which a lot of people don't understand. You have to have an armed force if you're going to have an armed overthrow of government. <laughs> uh, and the social theorists will say that if, if the government has a monopoly or a major monopoly of violence and technology, I would add today, then you're not going to develop an armed force that can match it. And uh, uh, so, but, but none of that kind of thinking is, go none of that sort of strategic thinking is going into those who want to think in terms of a violent uh, effort of some kind. So, but we're going we're gonna to do that in much better detail down the road. Yes, ma'am. That's, a, that's an interesting way of putting it, and I think there would be a lot of evidence to support that idea. But that may take a long time. I mean, uh, in Eastern Europe, as they, they came under the domination of uh, the Soviet Union with the, the end of the war, with the Soviet march across Eastern Europe pushing the Germans back and out of those countries, so those countries became, they came under the the, the wing of the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, uh, there, were, there was always opposition in every single one of those countries to communist authoritarian society and government. Always. You can read this. There are many books now on it. Uh, Czechoslovakia or Poland or East Germany uh, or Bulgaria, uh, Lithuania, and so <coughs> forth. There are a lot of studies and a lot of books that have been written about those op that opposition. It was always crushed. People were always being thrown in jail. It never had popular support because, after all, w out of World War, out of 1945, the people of Poland were exhausted by a bitter war that laid their country waste. So there wasn't a, a chance of putting together a popular uprising against the Communist Party in Poland. It's just a matter of a fact. Uh, so, um, the, the, but there were, there were scientists and students and engineers and political figures and artists uh, and clergy, uh, a, a wide range of people who were in opposition and did what they thought they could. Some of it spontaneous, some of it organized. Um, uh, students couldn't get jobs, could not go to the university because of their opposition all across Eastern Europe in the 60s and the 70s. So, uh, you know, they made, many made, people made bitter sacrifice, sacrifices. Um, uh, popular uh, unrest was there, but that unrest was not directed into hope, as you're suggesting, was not directed into a sense that we can do something. And while they may have applauded the, the various uh, 
artist groups that organize underground poetry and whatnot and meetings, uh, that kind of thing in Czechoslovakia. They did not join it. Uh, the, the unrest did not reach the place of uh, withdrawing consent until the 80s almost. I think so. I, I think uh, uh, because some of the uprisings in the 70s did not uh, accrue organized support, but some of the uprisings in the 70s were um, tainted by uh, little bits and pieces of violence, and so that meant repression <laughs> very fast and um, never took off. But in the 80s, there was a more concerted effort, places like Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, East Germany to say, um, uh, we have no troops, we have no weapons against this army and the police, and the uh, uh, intelligence units. The, so we have, to, we have to do it differently. And we, we cannot really have division among ourselves about this. In Poland, the folk who failed in the 70s reorganized and among other things, they said in the early part of the 1980s, in 1980, 79, 80, they said there will be no violence. There will be no Molotov cocktails. We will not batter the police. We will not throw stones. We will adopt nonviolent purely. This was uh, Lech Waleska, and we'll see that film next week. Um, but they made the determination. Anyone who's going to join us now, you must um, disavow any connection and relationship to violence. And they organized from that premise. They read Gandhi. They read King. Those books were translated into Polish. Uh, and um, so they made that a part of their... So they, they found a unifying um, social theory for resistance and action. And uh, that's certainly one of the reasons why the, uh, in Poland it was so successful. So the struggle may be long and bitter before millions of people wake up to what they need to do. But there's also a problem with methodology. Because in, Iraq, in the Iraq War in, in, in um, 2002, before the war began, Congress, I'm, I've read and I've been told, received 80 million emails. Uh, no to the war. Do not enter the war. Do not do it. Well, there's a difference between 80 million emails and 80 million people in 100 cities of the United States. <laughs> uh, you know, Five million people in Washington, D.C. <laughs> saying no to the Iraq war have, has, a much, has much greater power on Congress and the White House than 80 million emails. <coughs> and, and so what a, one of the things that I, I insist upon is that, that, the, that the, yeah, the emails may be important and letters are important uh, and whatnot and whatnot, but ultimately, if, if you're going to have a political theory that overthrows the, 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 the status quo that is in the wrong direction, you're going to have to have people who get into the streets, how, no matter how hesitantly. Well, I disagree. I think it has to be the people, and we have to put out our own communications. The media is hopeless for talking about the United States or issues of any kind. It doesn't matter what they are. It really doesn't matter what they are. They're almost, uh, you know, there's some journalistic groups that every year put out a report, the 25 stories that the media didn't mention. In 2006, there, there are two or three groups that do that, uh, and, and they, list, they list the stories that you never read. 
uh, in the print or the electronic media. So uh, I maintain that one of the things that has to be done is you, as you, in organizing for, sh for change, one of the elements has to be communication and it doesn't mean calling press conferences. It means developing your own communications to the people, to the public, uh, and, and go directly to the public. Uh, no media bias, no media uh, uh, in between. So, I, I, uh, some of this we'll be coming back to, but I, I need to move on if we can. I want uh, to talk very briefly well, it's 7.30. Let's take our break, 10 minutes, then we'll come back and uh, we'll pick up this business of uh, a nonviolent history. <coughs> I want to uh, walk with you for a bit in trying to help you see that what Gandhi meant when he said that nonviolence was the best kept secret of human history and why it is that uh, many of the episodes that you see in the A Force More Powerful um, book uh, have not yet appeared in the United States in any, in any uh, a basic historical form. History has primarily been written by the victors uh, and um, um, lesser forces in their mind, uh, uh, nonviolent struggle, uh, would represent lesser forces, uh, no matter how effective they might have been, uh, both in terms of ideas and in terms of direct action. But nonviolence, uh, has, it has to be said that nonviolence, but not that word, but the theory, the ideas, are to be found uh, in almost all ancient literature in some form. Uh, stretching very far back uh, in, the, in the ancient world. It is, it is my contention that with creation, we human beings receive the gift of power uh, because uh, at least in, in uh, the story of the book of Genesis, the first chapter in the Hebrew Bible, it is said very clearly that uh, human beings are recruited as participators in creation. Um, that in the creation of male and female human beings, they were blessed and they were told they would somehow participate in the rest of the world, in the plants and the animals and so forth and so on. So they were uh, uh, given the notion that they have power. So I sense, at least, that nonviolence has its early beginnings with, as families formed, uh, whether that was uh, 40 or 60,000 years ago, according to the uh, scientists and all, that in those clusters they did not use primarily competition or, uh, angry or, or anger, but they primarily used the things they did by uh, practical uh, behavior that helped to make a family uh, take shape and stay together and work together for their survival and, and the rest of it. But the ideas and the practical action of nonviolence uh, is to be found um, uh, in, in the ancient world. Uh, the ideas of love being a stronger force than fear and trust and confidence being more helpful in the long run for the human race than hatred or envy or jealousy, those ideas that are to be found in um, primarily Eastern religion, which is far more ancient than Western religion, um, uh, in uh, Confucianism, in Buddhism, uh, 600 years before Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, in Zainism, that was probably about 800 years, 900 years before Jesus of, of this era. The earliest written episode of uh, um, 
Some have said civil disobedience, but it can also be called just simply resistance to the king. It is to be found in the second chapter of the book of Exodus in the Jewish Bible, where because the uh, slaves were prospering uh, and multiplying, they were the skilled workmen or work people of Egypt, of the society, um, the Pharaoh ordered the midwives in their delivery to deliver uh, the male babies dead, uh, to, to uh, see to it that they were dead at birth. Um, and that second chapter of that book talks of two people, Sharak, and Ruah, who it's written in that language in that time, who feared God more than they feared Pharaoh, therefore they refused to do it. Uh, and they um, um, made excuses for it when Pharaoh called them in about it, but they, they rejected his orders and uh, the slaves continued to prosper. Yes. Women are a commodity. Yeah, like up until like relatively recently, yeah. Uh, there are there are those anthropologists, and I cannot give you now a name because I've not read some of this in recent years. Uh, but there are anthropologists that say that the oppression of women is a relatively y a new thing. It's about five to six thousand years old. Any of you done women's studies where this is being talked about, where this is being documented and talked about? It was not always that way, that, that this is a relatively in, in the 40, 50,000 years that uh, we have some, a little bit of knowledge of the human family, that this was not the dominant force by any means. that may have developed out of the warrior's class, the hunter's class, uh, the development of agriculture, and, and the like. Uh, but that, that it, is, it, is not, uh, it is not something that was uh, from the beginning in things. <coughs> None of you have done women's studies that have worked on this? Uh, there's a book called... Um, Oh, gee, I didn't bring it with me to come into to Nashville. Um, and I don't remember the author. I think it's called The uh, Cross and the Chalice, maybe. <coughs> I'll try to look that up um, and, and get, get you a copy of that. But that would be one of the studies of this that would indicate uh, that... Uh, the oppression of women is not all, have not, has not always been the case uh, in, in the rule. Well, I mentioned the earliest written account of a nonviolent action. It was not called nonviolence uh, uh, by any means. But they uh, did say no. And as far as I know, the story, the narrative does not indicate that they were punished. They went on pretending that they could never get to a birth in time, that when they arrived in the scene, the birth had already taken place, <laughs> said that the women were uh, unpredictable and uh, uh, babies would get birth before they got there most of the time, so something like that. Anyway, that's one example. Um, you want to remember that the earliest books of the, of the Jewish Bible are oral histories before they are written down. But the fact that it got st established and passed from generation to generation until writing was available indicates that it represents a pretty old story. That whole story is rooted somewhere around 3,200 years ago, 3,100 to 3,500 years ago. That's, that's pretty 
uh, that's a good long time ago. The first uh, story we have of a, of a major people's movement would be in that same book when um, um, these slaves began to move from Egypt into what is now Palestine, Israel, what we call the Middle East. Uh, the, the story in the Jewish Bible seems to indicate this is all at one time, but the scholars and the anthropologists and the archaeologists uh, indicate that the movement probably took place in several stages, not one big stage, but several stages. Uh, as um, these people who are the ancestors of, uh, of Palestine and Israel uh, marched, to, uh, marched uh, from Egypt uh, 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 away from slavery towards what they expected to be a better land and a better um, uh, a, a nation emerging that would suit their, suit their inclinations and the rest of it. Um, so the Torah is the, uh, is the earliest writing that we know of of a mass people's movement. And while it's in mythological language in the first 15 chapters of this book of Exodus, uh, because there's all sorts of magic in it, um, there's also all uh, many kinds of natural disasters as well as a lot of bloodletting. Uh, um, nevertheless, it does r represent large numbers of people organizing coming to a consciousness that they needed to leave Egypt, leave their plight, their condition, and that they needed to set off for themselves and find their own homeland and their own, or their own base. Um, it, it, uh, uh, the narrative writes of the mud and dirt and hunger and the struggle, the battle, the struggle within that community, within the march, uh, the leadership having a hard time keeping people united in the march, the problems of food and water and the rest of it. It, ge it, gives, the, 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 it gives many of the dynamics of any kind of large movement of people uh, um, uh, trying to uh, push themselves from one place to another and uh, uh, what they think to be a better place. There are people resisting the leadership of Moses and Miriam, his sister. Uh, there are many people who are disheartened. Their spirits have been broken, it says in one place, by the oppression. So they can't see any justification for why they're on the march. But they're on the march apparently because of the ethos of the whole community have fundamentally pressured them into doing it and not, not staying behind and not going off on their own. So it's a rather wonderful story of what can be called, in fact, uh, people's mass action. They had no army. They had no swords. Um, uh, they were marching on their faith and on the vision that Moses and others had. It shows how they had to strategize, that it required very, very hard work, that they had no maps. They were setting out on their own, but it, but, but it does reflect what a people's movement might very well look like. Um, from my earliest readings of those chapters, as a young person, I became convinced that they represented something more than what the story there seems to indicate, reading between the lines and reading some of the agony that they portray. Um, so th there is the action that can be called fundamentally nonviolent action. Um, Buddhism uh, began with the Buddha 600 years before Jesus. And a lot of people have compared some of the sayings of Jesus to the sayings of the Buddha. Uh, there is a great stress on love as being an, an integrative force and an integrative power in the life of people. There is the great notion that you cannot um, do evil and expect to get good seen out of it. 
there is the notion that you want to need to treat people like you want them to treat you in both Jesus and Buddha. Those are all some of the underlying uh, presuppositions of nonviolent theory. Nonviolent theory has the notion that human life is precious and of infinite worth and that it must be respected uh, as you try to struggle for change. Uh, whether you agree or disagree, whether you have to identify some people as being enemies or the like, that all human life must be fundamentally respected. That, of course, uh, you can see in the, de in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence of the United States, a civic document uh, that all people are created equal, that all are endowed by the Creator. It does not say God, it says Creator that all have certain inalienable rights, that those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that is an underlying presumption of nonviolent theory. The, the, the way you deal with others and the neighbor and yourself is through love. So Buddha, 600 years before Jesus, lays some of the theory that you see active now in Miramar because the big marches have been marches of Buddhists, monks. Uh, um, the uh, m the uh, monasteries and the, perhaps the, en the engaged Buddhist church, I do not know the scene there, but in Vietnam they called themselves the Buddhist church and they called their nonviolence engaged Buddhism. Uh, in the 60s in Southeast Asia. So I would assume this is a part of the same uh, element in Buddhism, uh, in uh, what, was, uh, what used to be called uh, Burma. So what the Buddha began in terms of the nonviolent spirit, though it was not called that, but the spirit of love and truth, uh, is very active in the, in the 21st century in some of these countries in, in Asia. Well, that's another example of nonviolence uh, in, in our history. But perhaps one of the most important episodes took place in the third century before this era by a, in India by um, the son of a king who was called Ashoka and who governed in central India. His father was the king in central India and his father had through conquest um, broadened the borders in central northern India into a very large kingdom. And when Ashoka became king, he was one of the major military commanders and he continued that life of conquest until he recognized the horror of the killing that his armies were doing and he was converted to Buddhism and so for um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 years he was a relatively young man when he became king as a Buddhist practitioner he sought to model his kingdom after the principles of Buddha, uh, after the principles of fairness, and so forth and so on. Um, some historians have called him the greatest emperor who ever lived. He no longer defended his empire by primarily violence, but by what he called righteousness. I have taken a quote from one of his things because his his. His, uh, his rocks, that he, he put his messages on rocks, and these rocks are still uh, seen in places of India. They're being preserved in museums and the rest of it. And this is what he wrote on one of these rocks. If anyone does me wrong, it will be forgiven as far as it can be forgiven. I even reason with the forest tribes and seek to reform them I am not only compassionate, I am powerful, and I tell them to repent lest they be slain. That's <laughs> typical king. 
I desire safety, self-control, justice, and happiness for all human beings. I consider the greatest of all victories is the victory of righteousness, that is, relationship and truth, and, and people living out of that um, kind of uh, substance. He is a very important figure in the spread of Buddhism because he was the kind of a devotee who helped to spread Buddhism into all of southeastern Asia, uh, into what is China and the like. So um, 